Tonight's story is absolutely phenomenal. Can you imagine a situation where you have a pet that goes, just, just vanishes out of thin air and you don't know where it's gone? And you can imagine all kinds of nightmare scenarios because your pet has disappeared. That's happened to me on two occasions and it's not something I would wish on my worst enemy. And I just hope that none of you have ever experienced such a situation. But tonight, we have a story that leads to a Bigfoot encounter, all because of a missing cat. So let's get started. Dear Sarah, my name is Hannah, and my story happened in the early 90s, which is a long time ago now. Isn't it amazing how time flies? I'm from a relatively small rural town, which is very remote and off the beaten track. So the area where I live is naturally very wild, without being disturbed even by loggers. I live in a pretty small cottage-style home with beautiful French windows and whitewashed walls, with a small geometrically-styled garden where the flower beds are surrounded with perfect lines of neat hedgerow, and even the bushes on our lands are designed and chiselled to look like great works of art, and they're always admired by the locals. We have a glorious stream trickling and flowing through the bottom of our garden, but it runs through the whole neighbourhood so that everyone lifting on the le living on the left-hand side of the valley on our street is blessed with the beautiful wa wa this beautiful watery addition to their properties, which would rival any water feature for sure. On the other side of the stream is a high hilly embankment that branches off into a vast area of natural forest that literally stretches back for miles upon miles, and that land, I believe, is publicly owned. At the, time I was living al at the time of my Bigfoot encounter, I was living alone with my three beautiful Burmese cats, and it was the day when one of my cats disappeared that my incredible story was to begin. Basil, my precious blue Burmese cat, was missing, and I loved him so very much. He had the most beautiful, easy-going, laid-back disposition, and he was so gentle and friendly and deeply affectionate, even to strangers. He had recently had a terrible accident when a neighbour had run over his foot, but the vet had bandaged it up after extensive surgery, and he had healed fully from this medical procedure. Now he had seemingly vanished into thin air, and there was no sight or sound of him. He was not a cat given to venturing far from my home, because he loved nothing better than lounging lazily on the couch all day, snoozing or taking a leisurely stroll to the front porch. He never wandered far. So to see that he was missing was very unsettling and upsetting, and something about his disappearance did not feel very right. I knocked on the doors of the, my nearest neighbours, but no one had seen sight or sound of him. I then drew up some posters with a picture of my cat on them, and posted them on as many tree trunks as I possibly could, hoping that someone might have seen him. A day went by with no one getting in touch with me about my missing cat and I was utterly devastated, and began to think that he had succumbed to a deadly fate. Maybe he had been eaten by a lone coyote or a wolf, or someone had run him over and covered up the evidence. You always imagine the worst-case scenarios when it comes to your missing animals. A day later there was a knock at my door, and I opened it to find a young girl standing there. I ushered her in, and she came into my living room holding one of my leaflets in her hands. She looked at me with a serious expression on her face that made my heart sink. Was she going to tell me that my cat was dead, I wondered. Oh, I was dreading what she was going to tell me. I think I know who stole your cat, she said. I looked at her in utter horror. You think someone stole my cat? It never occurred to me that such an idea was even a possibility. The locals in our areas were decent, law-abiding people. Was anyone really capable of something as horrid as this? It seemed highly doubtful. I don't think it, she said. I know it. But I cannot prove it. That's the problem. How do you know they have my cat, I asked. Because I've seen her stealing people's pets before. Have you not noticed the number of animals that have gone missing over the last couple of years in our local area? Well, I believe she's responsible for most of these cases. I suddenly remembered an article in the local paper talking about the peculiar disappearances of local pets in the area and how devastated the locals were 
about their missing animals. Could this girl be right that someone in our vicinity was stealing our cats and dogs right under our noses? Is this person stealing expensive pedigree animals like Burmese cats to sell, I asked. Is that her motivation behind taking my cat, making money for herself? I thought that that was what she was doing, said the girl. But the weird thing is that she has been stealing pets that are not just pedigrees, but are also moggies that were got from the, the local shelter. So she is indiscriminate by the animals she is actually taking. Will you show me where this woman lives, I asked. I got into my car with the young girl seated by my side, and we drove down a dirt road and took a turning to the left that spiralled down to a very bumpy dead end. We came to the end of a cul-de-sac, and the girl pointed towards a derelict-looking house that looked like it was falling apart at the seams and had not seen a lick of paint for years. Even the garden was extremely overgrown, with grass six feet high, and there were angry-looking weeds sprouting through the foliage and rambling bushes covered with sharp thorns absolutely everywhere. I told the girl to wait in the car, and I got out and opened the white wicker fence, and the creaky door nearly fell off its hinges as I walked up the remnants of what was once a paved pathway that had been taken over by rambling and climbing ivy. As I got to the front door and banged on the knocker, I could see the curtain twitching, as if someone was studying me and was making a decision whether they would answer the door to me or not. I waited for a long while, and nothing happened, and then finally the wood-panelled door squeaked open, and I saw her. She was elderly, thin, and had a mottled, thin, crepey skin covered in black liver spots. She had a long, beak-like nose, exactly like a vulture, and dark, horrible, deep-set eyes, surrounded by a purplish, shadowy rim. Her tussled silver hair hung around her face in haphazard, bedraggled clumps. Even her clothes reflected the same don't-care attitude of her appearance. She wore a pinafore-style black dress that looked as old and as faded as she was, and wrapped around her shoulders was a very whole, holy, brown knitted shawl. Yes, said the woman, eyeing me with suspicious brown eyes. What do you want? she barked in a gruff voice. Hello, I said. My name is Hannah. I live at number three on the red, red dirt road, I explained, over on the left-hand side. The cottage-style house, with a green roof and the whitewashed walls. You know the one. Yes, she said, looking at me with a hostile, defensive look. I do know the one. I presented her with a copy of my leaflet. I'm missing my blue Burmese cat called Basil, and I'm looking for him everywhere. I wondered if you might have seen him. No, said the woman, barely glancing at the picture of Basil. No, I have not. But the shifty look in her brown deceptive eyes told me a whole different story, and I could tell immediately that she was lying to me. Also, her body language gave her away, revealing a distinct look of awkward discomfort, as if she was definitely hiding something. I knew in that instant that this woman had my cat. There was no doubt about it in my mind. But the question was, what was I going to do about it? I thought as quickly as I could, and then I asked her, Can I come in for some water? I'm really parched. If you must, hissed the woman. Reluctantly, she opened the door to me, but she was not happy with me encroaching on her territory. As I walked inside, my eyes were looking out for any sign of my cat or any domestic animal, but the place was alarmingly quiet, with no sign of any animal life. Do you have any pets? I asked. No, she snapped. I hate animals. They're not for me, especially cats. I followed her into her kitchen, and she opened a cabinet to get me a glass of water. My attention was diverted to all the glass bottles of strange pickled ingredients on the shelves, and with horror I saw bottles of eyeballs, hearts, kidneys, tongues, and other internal organs, all on visual display, like a large scientific project. I do not believe they were of human origin, but they were disgusting nevertheless, and not what you would expect to see in a kitchen of all places. I couldn't help wondering if these pickled delights were included in her daily diet. No wonder she looked so hideous, I thought. After all, don't they say that you are what you eat? There was a huge witch-like cauldron on the gas hob, and something foul was boiling away heartily, and it smelt like rancid meat. It was utterly disgusting. 
I drank the water and thanked her as I walked through the passageway and retreated back to my car, looking around to see if I could see any signs of animal life, but there was nothing. What did she say? asked the girl as I started up the engine. She said she hadn't seen my cat, but I knew she was lying. I told you, said the girl. I promise you that vile woman is a witch. She definitely is stealing the animals. Her kitchen is full of pickled animal parts, I said. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's peculiar to say the least. The girl looked at me in utter horror. You don't think she could be eating the neighborhood pets, she suggested. My heart near narrowly missed a beat, and I looked at the girl with a horrified, astonished expression on my face. I never thought of that, I said. That woman is so odd, I wouldn't put anything past her. What shall we do, asked the girl. We cannot let this woman keep stealing our animals. We've got to stop her. Should we go to the police? We haven't got any proof, I said. You cannot randomly accuse someone without any actual evidence. Well, why don't we just get some, said the girl. We can creep up to her property during the night and investigate the back area of her home, which is where I suspect she's hiding the animals. It sounded like a great idea to me. Even though it was hardly legal snooping around someone else's pre premises, especially at the dead of night, but I just knew in my gut that this hideously ugly witch-like woman had my cat, and the idea of her boiling my pet in that cauldron of hers sent shivers of dread down my spine. It was early fall, and so there was a distinct chill in the air, so we both dressed warmly, and armed with flashlights I got into my car with the girl, whose name was Jenny and we parked the car a few yards away from the witch's house. I chose a secluded spot on the side of a large oak tree so that we would not be easily seen. We then proceeded to walk down the bumpy dirt road that was littered with large pebbles, making it precarious to walk down without hitting the stones with our shoes so that they would invariably shoot across the ground, making awkward tinkering sounds. That was the last thing we wanted to do, to alert anyone to our presence. We finally reached the white wicker fence, which was virtually impossible to open without it making a creaking sound, but somehow we managed to succeed without drawing any attention to ourselves, which was an miracle in itself. We slowly, very quietly closed the gate behind us, and we tiptoed through the long undergrowth, doing our best to avoid the thorny brambles. Finally we reached the back of the house, that was situated yards away from the large forest, Everything about the property was exceedingly creepy, and the whole area was deathly quiet. I noticed that there were no sounds of crickets in the atmosphere, no owls hooting, no barking of neighbourhood dogs, and no sounds of howling coyotes. It really gave me the impression that something wasn't right. Then I saw a huge pile of animal cages, piled one on top of the other, and there were people's dogs and cats in these cages and some of them were making frightened, whimpering sounds that were terrifying. I was furious. I have never seen such a desperately sad sight in my entire life, because it was utterly horrifying. I could not believe it was possible to be so heinously evil. I was now convinced that this woman was consuming our pets, and was completely stark raving mad. I had read articles before of weird serial killers devouring human flesh, and engaging in cannibalistic practices. And I had also heard of cats being killed for sacri sacrificial witchcraft rituals, but I had never heard of anyone eating our pets before. What was bizarre to me was that there was so much wild turkey out there, hogs, deer and rabbit, that could so easily be hunted. Not to mention one can just go to the local butchers and buy meat. So why would anyone choose to eat our pets? There was no excuse for it. It was utterly bizarre. On one side of the wall, there were three singular cages with cats inside, and using my flash flashlight, I got a glimpse of Basil. He had a look on his face of absolute terror. I opened all three of the cats' cages, and all three cats shot out like grease lightning, and even Basil shot out past me, not even knowing I was there, because all they wanted to do was flee. I wasn't worried because I knew these cats could find their way home to their owners, and so Basil would be home with me soon, 
and I was thrill thrilled that I would finally uh, that I had finally found him. Suddenly we heard a loud crashing sound, and I thought the evil witch was coming out of her back door. So I indicated to my friend that we needed to hide at once. We both hid behind this thick brambling brush and waited a while to see if we could see any signs of the woman. Suddenly we heard the crashing sound again. It was so loud it reminded me of wheel bin lids clanging together like a huge drum. We could hear something bipedal walking through the undergrowth. If you have lived in the country as for as long as I have, you can tell whether you're hearing an animal or a human when they walk past you. The problem was the crunching sound of these feet did not sound like they belonged to a light, thin woman, but instead to something monstrously big and huge, like a rhino or a bear. That, that was how hefty this person or individual sounded, but they were definitely on two feet. I suddenly smelt something really hideous, a smell I shall never forget as long as I live. Because it was so hideously vile, so repugnant, and it definitely smelt like skunk. It had that kind of ferocity to it. It was hideous. Then I suddenly heard the terrifying squeaking, meowing and yelping coming from the caged animal as this huge bipedal being approached the stack of cages piled up high against the back wall. The sound from these animals became increasingly more terrifying. Luckily, the old lady had left her outside light on, so we could clearly see the cages containing all the dogs and cats and the sounds they made was too heartbreaking for words. Then I saw him, and he was massive. This was the owner of the huge footsteps, and at first I thought he was a very big dark brown bear, because he was covered entirely with fur. Yet I could see by the way he was standing was that this creature was no bear. This was confirmed by the long arms that hung well below the knees, and the creature had very visible chunky hands, and not paws. What the heck is that? whispered Jenny. Shh, I whispered. The last thing I wanted was this creature to see us, or worse still, hear us. I heard the back door open, and I saw a small willowy silhouette of the elderly woman, who appeared to nod at this massive, dark, hairy, humanoid form, almost as if she was acknowledging him, like she would a friend. She then closed the door behind her and ventured back indoors. What on earth was she doing, I wondered, and what was her relationship with this strange, hairy humanoid? The creature went towards the cages and opened up one of the cages to grab up a big cat that was hissing at him in terror and wiggling violently in his huge hands. There was no merciful escape for the poor cat, because in one mighty thud and blow it was all over for the poor thing. I apologise, but I just don't want to go into graphic detail about this incident because I don't think your listeners would want to hear it. It was too deplorable to describe. And as I write, this memory brings tears to my eyes. That was someone's pet, I thought in horror. The creature turned in our direction, but luckily I do not believe he sensed our presence under the full electric outside light. I got an amazing view of him. And this was a beast that was so dreadful that I, it would fit so perfectly in your darkest nightmares. This hairy humanoid form had a definite ape-like feature to his appearance that was very clearly visible in his greyish long face with its very distinctive brow ridge, very flat dark nose, slender mouth and very deep-set dark eyes that at certain angles in the darkness glinted with a demonic red eye shine. At a guess this creature was eight foot tall and four feet wide. And what really got my attention was the humongous shoulders, the strange bullet-shaped head, and the evident absence of a, of a neck. I had never seen such a terrifying creature in my entire life, and you could tell by looking at him that he had a menacing presence and energy about him. I could tell that Jenny was utterly terrified. She was shaking so much that even her teeth started to chatter, as if she was freezing cold, but that was clearly not the case. Her eyes were as round as saucers, and her jaw was wide open with utter shock. What is this thing? she whispered. That witch is feeding our pets to him, she whispered. I was frozen in horror as I watched this formidable creature leaving the lady's premises with five-foot strides on his graceful long legs, and he moved quickly, swinging his arms backwards and foremost, forwards, 
with the dead cat balancing over his shoulders like a loose jersey. Why could he not kill a squirrel or another wild animal, whispered my friend. None of this makes any sense to me. I agreed. It was utterly insane. But the biggest question on my mind was, what on earth was this creature in the first place? Fast forward a day or two. I'm delighted to tell you that I got home to find Basil tucking into his cat kibble, and I gave him a large tin of tuna, which he scoffed in no time at all. It was so wonderful to have him home, and the reunion was incredibly emotional. He did suffer some anxiety after the ordeal, but after a while he bounced back to his usual laid-back self. But he became very suspicious of strangers, and never strayed far from the house again. I did call the police and animal services, and the woman received a hefty fine and a written, wa w written warning, and all the dogs were returned to their owners, and the cats as well. I never told the police that this woman was feeding the local pets to this creature. I knew that would sound crazy. They would never have believed me, and I did not so want to sound completely barking mad, because I'm sure my story would have appeared implausible. Two days after the incident and the reports in our local paper about the woman stealing our pets, I'm not sad to report that she was found lying dead in her house. The medical examiner said that it appeared as if her head had been savagely crushed and the death was considered to be a possible homicide. I had my theories about what had happened to the woman and who had killed her. There was one man in our town called Alf. He was a very tough, strong guy who was like as hefty as an ox and he had a very strong vigilante view about everything. He did not trust the government at all, and he believed that anyone who killed a person need to be sentenced to death. I think he felt that the law did not deal with perpetrators of crime well enough, and with enough toughness. The woman had been guilty of stealing his dog that he was fortunate enough to get back. However, I heard him tell the butcher that this wicked, evil woman deserved to be shot, and if he got hold of her, it would be over for her in a second. The following day she was found dead. My second theory was it was the creature who had come to get another pet to eat, and when he could not get some easy fast food from the woman in a, th from the woman, in a thunderous rage, he turned around and killed her instead. I did have three more questions that bothered me for several long years, until quite miraculously the answers came to me. Question one. Why was the woman serving our pets to this creature? Question two, why was the seemingly elusive creature who avoided humans not killing wild animals in the area like turkeys, rabbits and squirrels? It did not make any sense to me. He was not physically impaired or impeded in any way. Question three, what on earth was this hairy humanoid creature in the first place? One day when I was watching a television program about the Chinese markets where the customers eat dogs and cats, these people do the most barbaric things to these animals, and those animals lie down in those cages in utter terror and dread, knowing that they will be next on the chopping block. Chopping block. They even watch their fellow animals being killed in front of their eyes. I was to learn in horror that those terrified animals in those cages are pumping up tons and tons of adrenaline into their bloodstream on a perpetual basis until they are finally butchered. We need the terror, said the Chinese man at the market, and we do this procedure purposely, because the more adrenaline in the bloodstream, the tastier the meat. The customers like it this way, because the meat is delicious. At that moment, a light bulb switched on in my mind. Could it be the creature liked eating our pets, because he loved the adrenaline in the meat? It would be infinitely tastier to him than a squirrel he killed, in a few seconds that barely had any traces of adrenaline in the blood. The death would be very quick that way. Maybe the creature was addicted to the adrenaline-infused meat, as we might be addicted to a bar of chocolate. It all began to make perfect sense. I was also able to find out the answer to the final question I had in my mind when I turned into a programme called Finding Bigfoot in 2010, and I remember thinking to myself that the elusive creatures these people were looking for and couldn't find was called Bigfoot was indeed the creature that I saw that night in the fall many years ago. It was the first question that I still could not answer, and that was why would the strange woman go to such extraordinary lengths to feed a Bigfoot our pets?
I had heard from a friend who knew the local police officer involved in the case that this strange woman was heavily involved in the occult, and they found a room in her house with a hexagram on the floor, dark candles, strange files with weird ointments inside, bottles of strange herbs, and lots of books on different kind of spells. So I think we can safely say she was a witch of some kind. A psychologist I once quizzed about people who might eat their pets, or even humans, told me that this has been known to happen, and that we have to accept that we live in a world filled with very strange and weird people, and not everything that goes on behind closed doors is at all normal. So there we are. That's my story. I just want to say thank you so much, Hannah, for the most unbelievable story. It really is unbelievable. I think that everybody is going to be stunned when they hear this. And so many people wonder what happens to their missing animals. And to think that there was a woman doing such an evil thing out there is extraordinary. But we have to remember we live in a world where we have so many different kinds of people with different personalities and characters. And some of those people are not, not normal or not clear thinking or not sound in the head. So we have to realise that not everybody is decent and it's as simple as that. Until next time, goodbye and good night.